Hi, it's Paul here and I'm at the Gibson Guitar Studio in central London tonight. It's a very warm evening in London tonight and I'm hosting a Radio Academy event which is called Around the World. So it's all about broadcasting with radio all over the world, Australia, Asia, Europe, all over the place. That should be quite a fun event tonight. And it does mean that I get to catch up with a former boss of mine who is now an international radio consultant. I used to work with him at Heart in London. He was the launch program director for Magic as well, and now all over the place. And it's a pleasure to have him with me today. This is Francis Curry, welcome. Thank you very much. So your job now is international radio consultant, that means going all over the place, but you've coached, I and mean, certainly here in the UK, a lot of big names in terms of communication coaching. Yeah, in fact, it was one of the things that got me started on a, an NLP path. Um, when I started having to coach kind of communications experts, and my job was to make them better. And at that point, I thought, okay, I'd better go and figure out really a bit of the art and a bit of the science behind persuasion as well as just blagging it as most of us do in management and in every other part of our lives. Name some of the, the people that, I mean, certainly from my experience with Heart, there were some big names that are actually done a lot of stuff. I and mean, we're talking sort of people that were in bands and TV stars and people that had a lot of experience with communication. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, people like Jamie Thickson on Breakfast, Harriet Scott, people like Toby Anstis from TV, uh, people like um, Emma, who'd done a lot of Radio 1 work beforehand, all kinds of different people. Um, and outside of uh, Heart, I work quite a lot now with different people um, in sometimes in different organisations, but usually in radio or TV channels, coaching them as well, some of whom are happy for me to mention them, some of whom aren't. Right, OK. <laughs> and in terms of communication, obviously you've done a lot of radio, but in terms of how it would then relate to video as well, I guess there's quite a lot of common themes that run through communication in general. I think that's right. And I, I think, you know, um, I, I've trained as a hypnotist as well. And one of the interesting things about hypnosis is it kind of gives you more of a structure about how you manage excellence in communication. So if I give you what I would call a persuasion protocol, there are four stages. The first one is to get noticed. You have to get people's attention. So that's one. Part two um, is have an outcome in mind. What do you want from this communication? You know, so often in real life, we will drift through a conversation. Hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. Especially in a um, social environment, we often have never given a second thought about what we're going to talk about or what we're going to do. When you're trying to be persuasive or you're trying to talk to somebody, you need to have an end in mind. Um, so that's part two. Part three is all about rapport. If you haven't clicked with somebody, they're not hearing anything you're saying. You know, you, you know when you don't click with somebody and it's almost like you're speaking and you can almost see the words bouncing off right. their forehead back to you. You're kind of, they're not getting it. They're not hearing me. And when that happens, of course, you have to remember that's not their fault. That's your fault because you haven't figured out how to form an effective line into them. So that kind of establishing rapport is really important. Uh, then there's something about the conscious and the subconscious mind. And I think the most persuasive people learn how to bypass or at least talk in parallel to both the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. Now, the conscious mind does things like um, it's linear, it's logical, it deals with thought, it's analytical, it has a delay of around half a second. Deja vu, by the way, is often your subconscious noticing something and then your conscious becoming aware of it half a second later. Oh, well, that's just ruined deja vu for me forever then. <laughs> and typically in your conscious mind, you know, your brain can only manage roughly seven plus or minus two chunks of information at once. So, for example, um, one of the big surveys they did was a supermarket wanted to increase the amount of jam they sold. So what did they do? They reduced the range because it made it easier. Now, I think men get this more than women, but you know that feeling when you walk into a shop and you almost go dizzy because there's so much choice, it's overwhelming. So your conscious mind doesn't deal with big numbers of information too well. So whether you're designing a PowerPoint, whether you're interviewing somebody, whether you're talking on screen, you don't want to cover too much ground too quickly because people won't remember any of it. So does a word economy come into that? I mean, that's something that we've been taught in radio from the very beginning, how to shorten it down, how to get it to the point, how to use as fewer words as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as time goes on, if you look at any of the latest research on people's attention spans, if you look at how often a pop music video edits, if you look at the most popular Facebook posts, now they're less than 100 words, you know, we are in a time poor 
um, environment where people simply haven't got the luxury of half an hour or an hour to, to amble through the newspapers every day. So if you want to make an impression, one of the things you have to do is exactly word economy. It's get to the point and get there quickly, but you have to take the person you're talking to with you so that they understand the point or they get the point. So how important is it to know who you're talking to and know your audience? Well, I think if you're presenting a seminar, if you're presenting live, or if, you're, or if you're presenting on television, the more you know who you're talking to, the easier it gets. Now, the reason for that is simple. People like people like them. And I think if you're on television or you're presenting on a computer or a screen or in a video, then the more you can reflect your target market, the more easily they will interpret what you're saying. So let me give you an example. We're doing this media thing tonight and we're both wearing sort of media uniform, um, sort of jeans, kind of collared shirt. I've got the jacket on, you haven't, but I bet you've got a jacket here. You know, I've got a cardigan, actually, but, <laughs> but only because I thought, because it's so hot, but normally I would probably. So it's a media event tonight. Yeah. There'll be 100, 200 people in the room. Um, and so when I was thinking about that, I thought, what's going to be appropriate? So you almost choose a costume, I think, when you present in public, when you present on screen. Who are you talking to? You know, are you, is it okay for you to be shoveled, disheveled and scruffy? If you're selling the kind of work from home and fall out of bed image, then that might be appropriate. Um, if you're presenting a slightly more professional view or you want to be taken more seriously, maybe if you're premium pricing, then you want to look a little bit more aspirational or you certainly want to look like somebody who's an authority in their subject. And most businesses do intentionally or not have a uniform because ultimately people are tribal. And so, saying that we've got the rapport building going, saying we've got very clearly an idea of who it is we're talking to with our target audience, are there any powerful words or phrases that translate across the board? Or are there any words that sell, that are guaranteed to sell? Or does it always depend who it is? All right. Persuasion is a very deep subject. And, and in this short conversation, we're just going to touch the first few layers of that. So you can develop really extreme mastery. Um, and I would say, be careful about trying to do too much too quickly, because you can come across as artificial, and then people won't buy anything you're saying. So I would say, in terms of being persuasive, one of the most important things is be authentic. Be you. People watching and listening don't care if you stumble. They don't care if you lick your lips or you blink I'm too much. I'm always very grateful for that. <laughs> but it's true. Yeah. You could get so hung up, or you can get so hung up on something being perfect, it stops being real. Or well, actually, authentic's better than real because it is a performance to a degree. When you're on screen, if you've got cameras, if you've got lights, if you've got a microphone, to an extent, there is an artificiality in that. But often the great broadcasters, the great presenters are people who can just take all that in and just relax and be themselves. And actually, many of the great broadcasters on radio and television are the people who give a bit of themselves. So one, don't be too intimidated by too much jargon or too much technique because it'll get in the way. Two, know your subject. That really helps if you're trying to blag it off cue cards and so on, you know, people will spot that. Um, dress appropriately. Where you're interviewing somebody, I would normally recommend sit on the left-hand side of the screen. If you imagine most chat shows in the Western world, certainly in the UK, typically the host sits on the left and typically they're slightly higher than the guests who sit in a lower seat to the right. The reason for that... Sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> not always true. And the reason for that is typically in a Western culture, we read left to right, top to bottom. So in the same way that the convention for logos tends to be top left or centre, centre stage, or top left, read left to right, it's the dominant position on the screen. I've seen you've been using your hands an awful lot tonight. That was yeah. the final thing I wanted to talk to you about. Body language, how important would you say that is? Uh, body language is important, but again, don't overthink it, don't overplay it. You know, all you're trying to do is communicate, and what, what hand gestures, what face gestures often do is emphasise a point, sorry, emphasise a point, they make it a little more impactful, or you can take somebody with you, you can direct attention, if you do those kind of things. But it just come back to language. If you're gonna choose a couple of things uh, in terms of language, I would say be very aware that people have a preference in terms of language. Some people will have a preference for visual language, if you see what I mean. Other people will lean <laughs> much more towards sound, if you right. hear what I'm saying. 
Uh, and other people will be much more interested in kinesthetics, in feelings. So if you can grasp that concept. Now, when you're working with people individually, you can develop the flexibility in what I did in a very simple way just there is use different predicates. So I use visual, auditory and kinesthetic. When you're presenting to a group as much as you can, use visual, auditory and kinesthetic language. Don't just do what you might do naturally, which is push your own prejudice. If I'm visual, if, if my lead system is, is visual, I will tend to use a lot of visual language if you see what I mean. Um, if you're going to talk to a group of people, the more you can mix your language up, the more powerful it will be, the easier people will find it to connect with more of what you're saying. Francis Curry, thank you very much. You're welcome. And if you enjoyed that, there's more online at websitevideocoach.com. Thank you.